Hello everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Allison Alcott and I've, I'm a geologist. I've been working at Rockware as a trainer and a consultant since 2000. Um, I want to thank you all very much for attending this webinar. During the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give a quick overview of the interpolation options that are offered in our Rockwork 16 program. If you think of questions during the presentation, please go ahead and enter them into the chat box and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Um, now, before I want to get started, I want to clarify what I'll be discussing. And let me switch screen slides here. And I'll, I'll use this screenshot of the gridding options available in Rockworks 16 to do this. When creating a grid or a block model in Rockworks, you can select from a list of interpolation algorithms that are displayed on the left side of the options window. And along with selecting an algorithm, you can select from a list of interpolation options that are displayed on the right side of the window. Uh, for the most part, these interpolation options can be selected with any of the modeling algorithms to the left. And you can turn on multiple options at once. So while the interpolation algorithms are mutually exclusive, you can only select one at a time, these interpolation options are not. During the webinar, I'll be discussing these interpolation options only. I won't be covering the algorithms. For lack of a better way to organize the presentation, I'm going to just cover these in the order that they are displayed in the interface. I had originally planned on covering um, both gridding and solid modeling interpolation options, but realized once I started putting together the presentation that I was really only going to have time to cover the gridding options. Um, but many of the options that I'm going to cover that are available for gridding are also available for 3D block modeling. And I'll, I'll let you know as I cover these which ones are available for both and which ones are only available for gridding. First, I want to review what types of data would be used to create a gridded surface, which is an evenly spaced array of x, y, z values. Data that might be used to create these 2D grids include topographic information, stratigraphy and aquifer data, or perhaps some sort of surface or subsurface analytical measurement, such as assay data or groundwater contamination concentrations. As you can see in this slide, Grids can be displayed as 2D contour maps or as 3D surfaces, and they can also be incorporated into stratigraphy and aquifer models. Now moving on, the declustering option is at the top of the list in the interface. Declustering is available for both gridding and 3D, 3D modeling. When declustering is enabled, the program overlays the original data with a grid of cells and averages any points that fall into the same grid cell. It then uses those averaged points to interpolate the grid. In this slide, the points in the green box on the left would represent the original data, perhaps pulled from irregularly distributed boreholes or wells. And the next column of boxes to the right, which are labeled coarse, medium, and fine, represent various declustering grids. As you can see, the user can adjust the density of the grid to adjust to determine how many points will remain after the declustering process. The column to the right of that, shaded with a turquoise background, represents the averaged values based on the declustering grids. And you can see that there is now a red control point in the center of each grid cell. It's these points that would be passed on to the modeling algorithm to create the Rockworks grid. If you have a very, de very densely spaced data set, for example, LiDAR data, turning on declustering can drastically speed up the modeling process. The declustering option also comes in handy when creating 3D models based on densely spaced borehole data, such as borehole geophysics. The modeling time can be decreased significantly by using declustering, and models that are created with and without declustering enabled are typically very similar. So for me, if you're working with a large data set, it's kind of a no-brainer. I just almost always turn on declustering. The next item on the list is the logarithmic option. And like the declustering option, it is available for both 2D gridding and 3D block modeling. The logarithmic option was specifically designed for users modeling parameters that vary sp spatially over several orders of magnitude. Um, and a good example of this would be soil or water concentrations. It helps limit the effect of very high measured values on the entire grid. So if you're working with groundwater concentration information, you'll op often have a, a few very high measurements um, that, you know, range in the hundreds of thousands. And then you'll have, you know, non-detects or very low measurements that um, 
have you know values less than one. Um, this example shows a contour map created with the logarithmic option disabled on the left and enabled on the right. And you can see that the shape of the contours and the distribution of values in the grid are drastically affected by this logarithmic option. When it's enabled, the program calculates the natural logarithm of each data point and uses the log data to interpolate the grid. And then the gridded values are converted back to values that, more, that resemble your measured values by using an exponential fun function. And this is a, a pretty common technique that I've seen other people use with other programs. It's just that other gridding pro programs don't typically have just a switch that turns this option on. You have to go through the process of um, you know, calculating the natural log of the data in a spreadsheet, gridding that, and then using some sort of grid math to, to convert your gridded values back to normal values. So. Next on the list is high fidelity. And again, this option is available for both gridding and 3D solid modeling. When enabled, this option will tweak the final grid so that it will better honor your data. As an example, let's assume that this diagram represents a cross-sectional display of some measured elevation values represented by the blue, um, the blue points or circles. The blue line represents a grid that is created based on these elevations. And you know, you could, let's just say you're using Krieging or inverse distance. Your grid will often look look like this. As you can see, the grid doesn't honor the data exactly. It comes really close, but it's not exact. And a discrepancy between measured and model values can be caused by a number of factors, often related to the interpolation algorithm you've selected. For example, you might just be using two, if, if you're using, you know, 10 points to estimate the value for each grid cell, then you could end up with kind of an averaging, average, averaging effect at your highs and your lows um, within the grid. The program addresses this by calculating the residual for each point, and this is the difference between the measured data and the modeled values in the grid. Um, the residuals are typically pretty small numbers, and they're displayed in this lower diagram as, as the blue points. Once the residuals are calculated, the progr program interpolates a second grid that is based on these residuals. Um, and so in this example, the residuals grid would rep be represented by the red line. The program then adds the two grids together to produce a grid that better honors the original data. Keep in mind that if you have more than one control point within a grid cell or a model block, then the high fidelity option isn't going to do much for you because it wouldn't be possible for one grid cell to honor multiple measured values. In that case, if you really want your data, your grid to honor your data exactly, you need to decrease the spacing of your grids. Um, in cases where you do have more than one control point within a grid cell, the high fidelity option would typically result in an average of the measurements within the cell. Also, if you're creating a very large model that's ar that already requires a lot of computing time, you may not want to turn this option on because it can double the amount of time required to create a model. Um, this might be overkill if the model runtime is already several hours. So, so just keep in mind that with much larger data sets, you may, you may not want to turn this option on. Next on the list is poly enhancement. If poly enhancement is turned on, the program first fits your data to a polynomial surface. And in this example, the red points represent measured elevations, and the planar su surface represents a best fit first order polynomial surface. The program then warps the polynomial surface to match your data using a method similar to that described for the high fidelity option. You can choose the order of the polynomial surface, or you can have the program run through a number of available options. I think we support first through six order polynomial surfaces, and then the program will choose the best match. Um, this can come in handy if your data reflects some sort of regional or local trend, and I found it most useful when modeling larger scale structural surfaces, and also when modeling groundwater elevations. This option is only available for gridded surfaces. It's not an option for 3D block models. Moving on, I'll talk about the smoothing option, and this option is available for both grid and solid modeling. When activated, this tool averages the z-values in the grid model based on a user-declared filter size. So it will create the grid initially, and then it will run this smoothing filter over the grid as a second step. 
Um, the smoothing filter can be run one or more times, and especially for solid models, the smoothing tool tends to create prettier models and diagrams. Just keep in mind that the more you smooth the grid or model, the less likely it will be to honor your actual data. If you like the look of a smoothed model, say you've created a plume model that looks, that looks really ideal, but you really want the model to honor your data exactly, you might consider turning on the high fidelity option in, conjun in conjunction with the smoothing filter. In this example, I've used the triangulation gridding al algorithm, which typically creates pretty blocky contours that you can see in the upper right hand or upper left hand corner um, to model some groundwater contamination con concentration values. And you, as you can see, as we increase the amount of smoothing iterations, the contours become smoother. Also note that the highest modeled value in the grid goes down as smoothing increases, which reinforces what I said earlier about smooth models not always honoring the original data. And again, you know, my solution to this, if I really liked the contours in the lower right-hand corner, would be to use three smoothing iterations but turn on the high fidelity option as well to bump that high value in the center of the plume back up to um, the highest measured value. The Densify option is a very useful tool that is only available for two-dimensional gridding. And when this option is en enabled, the program uses triangulation to add additional control points to the data set. It then uses the triangulated data along with the original data to create the grid. In this example, I'm using the Densify option along with just a standard inverse distance interpolation method. You can see that as we increase the number of densification passes, which adds more control points to the data set, the contour lines smooth out significantly, the bullseyes are minimized, and the contours better reflect directional trends in the data. Um, Densify is not, is not appropriate for all data sets, but I find it very useful when I'm modeling structural surfaces or often groundwater concentration, I'm sorry, not groundwater concentrations, groundwater elevations. Um, if your data if you're working with concentration data that's typically not linear distribu linearly distributed, it's often more of a logarithmic distribution, then turning on Densify isn't necessarily a good idea. Um, when you turn on densification, what you're really doing is combining whatever interpolation method you've selected, for example, inverse distance or Krieging, with triangulation. And as you increase the number of densification passes used, your grid will increasingly look like a triangulated grid. The maximum distance filter option is used to define grid nodes that are beyond a user-specified distance from a control point. The values that are assigned to these outside nodes can be null values, which would show up as white space in a contour map, or they can be user-defined values such as zero or some other sort of number. This option is available for both 2D gridding and 3D solid modeling. And as you can see in this example, if you use a very small cutoff distance, you'll end up with rings of colors and contours around the orig original control points. So that's what we're seeing in the upper left-hand corner. This changes as we increase the cutoff distance to the right. Last but not least in the options um, is the option to model color rather than a numerical value. And in the interface, this is labeled this option is labeled Z equals color. The Z equals color option should only be turned on when you're creating a model or a grid based on color data that's stored in the color table in the Borehole Manager database or within the utilities data sheet. If you've created a color model, you, you also, um, and you, well, and if you've created a color model using, um, if you've already created a color model and you simply want to display it, then you would also need to choose a special color scheme that's available for both Rockplot 2D and Rockplot 3D. This is a fairly unknown feature in Rockworks that isn't used by a lot of people. Um, but keep in mind that if you've logged Bunsell colors in the field and would like to display these in models or even in strip logs, that we have a tool for, for converting Munsell codes to Windows color number, numbers, and those colors can then be modeled or displayed in the program. Please keep in mind that if you're getting started on a more compl complex project, we're always happy to take a look at your data and make suggestions on how to, 
approach the modeling process, you know, which of these options would be appropriate and which of these options wouldn't. Um, I want to leave you with this slide that lists ways to get more information about the program or to even make a purchase. As many of you know, we released RockWorks 16 in July, and we've been continuously adding new features ever since. Our next in-house workshop, our workshops are held in Golden, Colorado, and our next one is scheduled in November, and we actually do have a few seats left. It's starting to fill up, but we do have, I think, about three seats left. Um, also, keep in mind that we're always available to schedule custom online training sessions. These are becoming more and more popular. Thank you for joining, and we'll go ahead and take questions now.